Cool, guys. So I think Mark did a good job of setting the stage around what DNA is all about, some of the cool things that we have going on in DNA. Um, myself uh, and Peter Jones are going to drill into the next section, which is all around kind of the base level of DNA. Remember the bottom of that pyramid where Mark was talking about Cat9K, we were talking about UADP ASIC, programmability. That's really what we're going to drill into here. What we basically are going to go over is what the importance of flexible infrastructure as a base for what we're doing in DNA. Now, who can tell me what that is? Who can tell me what that's a picture of? That is a gen engine. In fact, that is a J58 engine out of one of these guys. So that's our 71. Anybody who's ever seen me present knows that I'm really into rockets It's a high performance aircraft and all that kind of stuff. So always be a part picture of a rocket or some sort of high performance aircraft in my presentation. The other reason I put it in here is because uh, Peter and I tend to present at a relatively high bit rate. Right? We tend to go through things rapidly. We've got a lot of material we're going to go through in the next 30 minutes. So uh, let's get started on that. So by way of introduction, my name is Dave Zachs. I'm a distinguished engineer on the Enterprise Networks Access team. Um, so basically what that means is I tend to work on things that are anywhere from 12 to 36 plus months out, trying to figure out what we need to be building now to have to sell to you then, right? So we're always building ahead. We're always building forward. And the th main things that are in my headlights right now are two areas, uh, flexible infrastructure, which we're going to talk about right now, flexible ASICs, as well as fabric architectures and all the stuff we're doing with SDA, which were really cool to see that all coming out here at, at Cisco Live for the first time. I will be sharing this session. Peter and I are actually going to tag team this session. Uh, Peter's a familiar face at Tech Field Day, and uh, Peter and I are going to be talking about UADP, the UADP ASIC as we go through things. So I think really this is kind of an ambitious day that we have ahead of us because we're going to cover a lot of stuff during this day. And what we really want to do today, myself and all the other speakers that you're going to see, is we really want to talk about Cisco innovation, right? And, and specifically the way that I kind of usually phrase this is from the gates to the GUI. And by gates, I don't mean this kind of gates, I mean these kind of gates, silicon gates, and the innovations that we're driving in silicon, the innovations that we're driving in software, and how those are really the underpinning for what we do in terms of platforms and solutions. So how they, they support new platforms like Cat9K, and how they support new solutions like SDA, because it really is a continuum of innovation all the way from the bottom to top, and so we have the honor of, of starting at the bottom of that, which in my opinion is the coolest area of technology anyways. And really what we want to do is explain why these innovations matter. We don't just want to thump our chest and say, hey, look at all these cool things we're doing, although we think we're doing a lot of cool things. We really want to talk about why these matter. Why do these matter to you guys? Why do these matter to customers, these innovations that, that we're building? So it's going to be quite a ride as we go through this. So let's get started. Uh, so this is a tweet that Chuck sent out a while back. And as much as I happen to agree with this particular tweet when Chuck sent it out, the network's going to be more important than it's ever been. I'm actually going to take the liberty of correcting Chuck and saying, in my opinion, it's actually about innovation in the network is going to be more important than it's ever been before because networks are changing fast. I mean, I've been involved in the computing industry, involved meaning having a job that pays money since 1989. I've been doing networks since 1985, so this is my 32nd year uh, in doing networking. And I truly believe that if we do our job properly, that we have the opportunity to a whole different way over the next two, three, four years, because fundamentally we, Cisco, the industry, you guys, have all built networks the same way fundamentally for the last 20 years, right? We've had little tweaks and you know changes in protocols and stuff, fundamentally same designs. I really think that's gonna change going forward. And there's, some, there's a lot of good reasons you're gonna see as we go through today why that needs to change. So innovation is critically important. One of the things that you talk, constantly see is you will see our senior leaders standing up on stage holding up an ASIC, they'll be holding up a, a chip like this, and the chip that Dave Geckler's holding there is a UADP, a 3850, right? This is a UADP 1.1. It's the heart of the 3850 switch. I also have one here that's the heart of the Cat9K switch as well, the next generation of this. And we'll constantly see our executives standing up on stage and saying ASICs are a pillar of Cisco innovation. I think that's absolutely true, but what we really want to do is double click into this and explain why and explain some of the cool stuff uh, that we're doing with our chips. So really, at the end of the day, it's about a fusion of hardware and software. We've been evolving our software. We've been evolving iOS. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later when I come back after Peter talks. Um, but at the same time, it's really about that fusion of hardware and software. People that are really serious about software should build their own hardware. Uh, this was said by Steve Jobs and introduced the iPhone 10 years ago this year. But it was also uh, previously said that it was actually originated by a computer pioneer named Alan Kay. So when we think about the hardware that we make in enterprise networks, quantum flow processor and unified access data plane 
our primary routing and our primary switching silicon that we build. One of the things I draw your attention to here is that both of these chips have this attribute of being fully programmable. UADP, for example, being so fully programmable that it has no inbuilt knowledge in this chip of what an IPv4 or IPv6 or MPLS or CAPWAP or GRE or VXLAN, it, no inbuilt knowledge of any packet format. It knows those things because we program it to know through microcode, right? And that's really significant. Now, in order for us to talk about ASX, we need to have a bit of a common language around chips and a little bit, uh, delve deep a little bit on uh, how we build ASX. So when we think about this, and ASIC actually starts off with an originally, way back when, in a planning cycle with a whiteboard discussion. A bunch of folks from marketing and engineering gathered around a whiteboard. Marketing asks for the world. Marketing always asks for the moon, the sun, and the stars. Engineering says, I can give you the moon, but the sun and the stars are going to cost more money. There's a give and take. And at the end of this, you end up producing, after several months, what's called a microarchitecture document, a detailed specification, thousands and thousands of pages long about the spec for the chip. So now that we've all decided over that period of time what the chip should be able to do, the next step with the chip is you actually code it. So for example, this particular chip here, UADP 1.1 has three billion transistors on it. The next generation version of this chip, this guy here, UADP 2.0, which is the heart of the Cat 9K, has 7.46 billion transistors on this chip. Do you honestly think that any human or team of humans lays out seven and a half billion transistors on chip? Not humanly possible. So the chip gets written as code. We write it as Verilog code, two common languages in the industry, we use Verilog. So that disk chip that is seven and a half billion transistors is almost 2.2 million lines of Verilog code. So this is equivalent in complexity to what you would see in an entire operating system. Now once we've coded the chip to deliver on the specifications uh, that we want it for, the next stage is you run it through a process called synthesis. Synthesis is like compiling the, uh, the design, but it doesn't compile to a piece of software that would run on your laptop or your smartphone. Uh, what it compiles to is a circuit diagram called a net list. And that's a file, maybe a gigabyte in size or so, that we send out to Chip Foundry, and then a couple of months later, they send us back a completed wafer. So they would send us back something that looks like that, um, that would be a completed wafer with a whole bunch of chips printed on, onto that wafer. And it actually takes about a couple of months to manufacture those. Manufacturing a single wafer in Foundry from a ultra pure disk of silicon to something that has chips imprinted on it takes about a month. It takes about as long to build one of these as it does for Boeing to build a 747 uh, or a 787 in one of their factories. So when you see this, what we're really talking about here is moving from discrete transistors. We're talking about moving from you know, separate transistors like these guys you should see here. I'll pass some of these things around so you can look at them actually. That's a UADP 1.1. That uh, is a UADP 2.0. Oh, so what we're really talking about here is uh, moving from this concept of discrete transistors to miniaturizing them. The next step in the standard miniaturization that we use in industry, uh, generally down to about 22 nanometer sizing or so, is called MOSFET, Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor. This is a thing that you should go home and quiz your family on, get your kids to memorize that and then quiz them on that. Once we need to go below 22 nanometer sizing, and I'll explain a little bit more about nanometers in a second, we go to a next type of transistor called a FinFAT. So basically what we do is we take the center part of the transistor, we spin it on its side, we build it up in three dimensions. That allows us to shrink smaller than that. And what we're really talking about here is building gates. Because remember, we, I said from the gates to the GUI is where we really want to take you today. So there's really two type of, there's only really two type of logic gates that our entire industry, not just the networking industry, the entire technology industry is built on two fundamental types of circuits which are called NAND gates and NOR gates. These have the unique property that you can build any type of Boolean logic, any type of Boolean logic out of those two gates. Every other type of gate can be expressed as a combination of NAND gates and NOR gates. So effectively what we do is we manufacture millions and millions of those onto a die and that produces the chip. But it's basically those two fundamental circuits are the basis of everything we do. That UADP 1.1 I passed around there has three, about uh, three billion transistors on it. That's 191 million gates. UDP 2.0 is about 7.5 billion transistors. That is about 270 million gates on that chip. Now, here's just a fun fact. I mentioned that I'm into space and rockets and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we put a man here back in 1969. We put a man on the moon using this thing called the Apollo Guidance Computer. This was a guidance computer that was in the Apollo spacecraft. And that was actually built with about 4,100 ICs, each of which had a single gate on it. Stop and think about that for a second. We put a man on the moon with less than 10,000 transistors, but today we use seven and a half billion transistors to route your packets in a switch. And of course, with all the appropriate security and segmentation and quality service, 
crypto and fragmentation and all the other things we do, um, pretty amazing progression that we've all had in technology. And I don't think we actually stop enough to sometimes realize how, how far we've come and how far we're going. So what we're really talking about is transistors and how many transistors we can pack in a die. Everybody's familiar with Moore's law and the concept of you know, ever increasing density in silicon. And so we're constantly shrinking this nanometer sizing on the chips. Now a nanometer is actually a hard thing for people to understand. So maybe a bit of a comparison. Can, it's, not on, it's not really on a human scale. A human hair, if you look at a hair maybe on, on your arm, uh, you would see that a human hair is about 100,000 nanometers of width. Maybe gives you some concept of the scale. But maybe if we delve in out a little bit more, if we took a single human hair and put it in cross section and uh, made that cross section of a single hair as tall as the Empire State Building, on that scale, a red blood cell stretches up to about the 10th floor on this particular scale. A bacterium would stretch up to about the third floor on this scale. A piece of protein, a strand of protein, would be about the size of a small dog down there in the sidewalk next to that uh, Empire State Building sized hair. And finally, we come to this little pinprick over here, which would be about the size of three pennies uh, stacked end to end against that Empire State Building sized hair. That is a nanometer. And we build transistors on chips sized in nanometers. If you don't think this is magic, then I don't know how to explain magic to you. Right? This is amazing technology that we, that we all use every day. So why do we even build our own silicon? I mean, there's a lot of expense and a lot of time and a lot of man years and a lot of brain power that goes into designing our own silicon. Why do we even do it? And, and uh, to me, it really comes down to these five factors that you see here. Simpler deployment options. If we want to deliver on something like stackwise or stackwise virtual, or we want to deliver on virtual switching system, these type of things. We require support in silicon for the packet headers and packet formats and the capabilities we need to do that. We might want NetFlow. So for example, if we take a look at merchant silicon in the industry, merchant silicon might only give us sampled NetFlow. Now sampled NetFlow, sampling one out of every hundred packets, is okay for baselining the network. Statistically, over a long enough period of time, you'll get a good idea of baseline how the network's performing. But it's virtually, sampled NetFlow is virtually useless for security use cases. What am I gonna, I'm gonna sample one packet out of 100, so 99 out of 100 threats flow through undetected, probably not good. So we want to build in sampled net, or, or part full flow net flow on our chips, cost more money to do that. We have to design it out of the gate for that functionality. But the thing I really want to draw your attention to here is this concept of flexibility and investment protection via programmability. Because we have a unique capability in the industry that we've actually been shipping for over four years in the 3850 and now we're enhancing it in the CAT 9000. So if we take a look at a traditional ASIC pipeline, a traditional ASIC pipeline would look like this. I'd pull a packet into front, let's say an IPv4 packet, and the first block it goes to on a chip is a parser block. The job of the parser block is to figure out what is this packet. It looks at it and goes, oh, it's a 0800 ether type. Uh, it, therefore, it's an IPv4. I parse it these particular fields. And so I figure out what it is, and then I pass it down a processing pipeline, L2, L3, NetFlow, ACLs, all the things I'm doing. Assuming I haven't decided to drop it somewhere along the way, I'm going to modify it at this point. Maybe I'm going to decrement TTL for next hop. I'm going to modify MAC address for next hop. I'm going to update some stats and counters. I'm going to schedule a packet out. This is how any traditional ASIC works. And maybe this particular chip here handles IPv4 and IPv6. So I can do both v4 and v6 in this particular chip. But remember, that chip started off as software. And so the software is going to be written. Software that got turned into hardware of the chip is going to be built to recognize certain functions or certain protocols. Let's say that an MPLS packet comes along. This is an 8847 ether type. So this comes along into a parser, and a parser block doesn't know how to recognize that ether type. There's only two things you can do on a fixed config chip at this point. You can either drop the packet. If you don't know what it is, you can just throw it in a bit bucket. Or the alternative is you can punt it to CPU. But if you punt it to CPU on a device, you're going to go from tens of, or hundreds of millions of packets per second to probably a few thousand packets per second. So that's not really an answer. So when we think about what's happening in the industry, there has been a big industry trend for a couple of years around software-defined networking. Now, SDN to me is kind of like the, uh, the uh, half a dozen blind guys that are gathered around the elephant. One's feeling the legs and going, it's a tree. Another one's feeling a trunk and going, oh, you know, it's a snake. That's SDN. You could ask 10 different people and you get 10 different answers to what SDN means. We know what we think it means. Uh, but whether you believe it means open flow or overlays or orchestration, Whatever you think it means, it requires support in the underlying silicon to make it happen because the protocols and encapsulations and functions are evolving rapidly, right? But, so there's this, uh, there's this flexibility that we require in networking, 
but there's a big disconnect there with the way that a traditional fixed chip works, right? If you ask customers, how long do you expect a switch to last in your network? They will say minimum five years. Average is probably seven years, sometimes more. I've had customers that have used switches for t more 10, 12 years in their networks. So that was cool when networking wasn't changing all that fast, but now it's changing fast. We have VXLAN, we have new, pro new versions of VXLAN, like VXLAN GPE, generic protocol end cap that are on the horizon going through IETF standardization right now. We have network services header. We have all these different encapsulations that we might be interested in. And I can't go back to customers and say, hey, you want that new function in your network? You gotta rip and replace all your switches, right? That's not a good answer, right? What we wanna do is drive innovation at the pace of software, but make it realizable at hardware speeds. And our engineers saw this coming several years ago. That's why we developed this concept of, of flexible ASIC. So a flexible or programmable chip balances all three factors. It gives us a cost metric of a fixed chip. It gives us a performance of a fixed chip. It gives us a flexibility that approaches what we could do with a CPU. And we do that through a level of microcode upgradability. Throw a new microcode on a chip, what you would see as an iOS upgrade, get a whole new level of functionality on the chipset. So if you take a look at how this is instantiated out in our products, 3550, 3750, uh, back in the day were tr very traditional fixed function, fixed configuration chips. And then we went to 3850, and you can see the quantum leap here in terms of complexity of the platform, right? You're m many, many uh, greater number of transistors. First one was 1.3 billion, then 3 billion, and now in, in the uh, latest Cat9K, 93, 94, 9500, we're up to 7.5 billion transistors. Now, this is all Cisco developed silicon. And one of the things you see is that this drives vertical integration because we control the hardware. We control the software. We can make those things work together in concert. And there's lots of other examples of that. If you take a look at other companies that are vertically integrated, like Apple and like Tesla, it's very much the same thing. You, you control the hardware, you control the software, you control the destiny of, of your solution. Very, very important. So I'm going to delve briefly into this one topic, and then I'm going to hand over to Peter. Uh, Mark mentioned before about this concept called encrypted traffic analytics that we're de delivering here at Cisco Live. This is very cool because what we're actually trying to do here is spot encrypted malware in the network or spot encrypted threats in the environment. How, but do that in a way that we don't have to actually decrypt the underlying traffic. And that seems like an unsolvable problem at first. How can you spot something if you, if you can't decrypt it in the network? So what we do with encrypted traffic analytics is, Mark mentioned, we leverage two things. We leverage what's called the IDP, the initial data packet sequence. And we also leverage this thing called SPLT, sequence of packet lengths and times. So with the initial data packet, what we're looking at is about the first 10 packets in every flow. We, take, we inspect those packets, and through that, we can determine what cryptographic algorithms are in use. There's actually a lot of information you can glean out of the first packets in any individual flow. So for example, if we see something that's used in an OpenSSL library, that may be suspect because a lot of the malware out there uses that particular library because you know it's open, and open source, anybody can use it. Uh, the other thing we do is we use sequence of packet lengths and times, so we actually look at the packets, we look at which direction they're flowing, we look at their length, we look at the inter-packet gaps, and through that we are able to actually fingerprint the application. This is what a Google search looks like. So you can see here, if you draw your attention over here to the Google search portion of this, what you're seeing is everything below the line is server to client communication, everything above the line is client to server. So here's a Google search. This is Google serving up the initial web page to you. This is you typing your search into Google. So as you hit a character, they do a search on it, right, for their predictive typing. And then when you've done your search, this is them actually serving the results back. That's a fingerprint on network. It's all encrypted, but we can see the flow. Now look at how different this is over here with this, uh, the best of is a banking Trojan. First of all, we can see it's got a self-signed cert, which is immediately suspect. And then we see that there's a massive amount of data flowing from the client out to the server. This is data being exfiltrated from a device. The fingerprint looks extremely different, even though we don't have to decrypt any of that. So that's what Mark was referring to earlier when he was talking about being able to fingerprint these encrypted applications. We're pretty excited about what we're delivering with ETA.